Hi, students in my Old Testament class, uh, Old Testament 301. I hope you enjoyed the book of Leviticus as much as you can. It's a difficult book, challenging book, but I hope that when I get done today, I can help you appreciate it a little bit more as I show you uh, Jesus Christ is all through, woven through all the book. It, it is all those sacrifices are a typifying of him. They're shadows of him. They point to him. Uh, the book of Leviticus uh, gets its name. Uh, Leviticus just means having to do with the with the Le Levites. And if you recall, Jacob had a son named Levi, and Moses and Aaron are descendants of Levites. And so those Levites who said when, the, when Moses said, "Who show, who's on the Lord's side?" and they stepped up to the plate after the the worshiping the golden calf, they said, "We will." And so uh, they were chosen by the Lord for their valiant, being so valiant, and they were the ones chosen to um, administer in the temple and to set it up, to carry it, to work in it, to sacrifice in it, and so forth. I hope you liked uh, the Bible Project video. Um, I wish we were together. I would want you to share with me what's one thing that expanded your understanding, deepened your understanding of this book. And, but since we're not together, let's go on. We could outline uh, Leviticus in this way. Um, chapter 1, laws concerning sacrifices, all the way up to chapter 7. And then we start talking about laws, the consecration of priests, and then the laws concerning purity. And then, of course, the Day of Atonement and laws concerning holiness. And then laws about vows, um, like a Nazarite vow. Well, some of you might have thought, well, wasn't the law of Moses given as a rebuke to Israel uh, and imposed upon them as a punishment for rejection of the higher law? Some have thought that. And I like what the student manual says. It says, no, every law is meant to lift and inspire, reconcile and perfect. That principle included the law of Moses. It was a punishment only in the sense that it was less than they could have received. So another question you might have thought is, what's the major importance of the book Leviticus? I felt like the video Bible project brought it out. I felt like the student manual did. But in case you didn't catch it, Exodus gave directions for building the temple. Leviticus gives the laws and the regulations for worship in the temple. So, and I think it's one thing that's important to always remember when you read Leviticus and that each offering, sacrificial offering, there are at least three distinct objects presented to us. There is the offering, there is the priest, and the offerer. What then is the offering? What is the priest? Well, simple. Christ is the offering. Christ is the priest. Christ is the offerer. As, as an offerer, we see him, man under the law, standing as our substitute for us to fulfill all righteousness. As the priest, um, we have him presented as the mediator, God's messenger between himself and Israel, between himself and us. While as the offering, he's seen as the innocent victim. One of the first commandments given to man after being expelled from the Garden of Eden was that he should worship God and present the firstlings of his flocks for an offering unto the Lord. Although for many days after Adam received the commandment, he did not understand its purpose, Adam and Eve were obedient to the commandment to offer sacrifice. Eventually, due to Adam's obedience and supplications, an angel appeared and revealed the significance of this holy ordinance. This thing, the angel said, is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. The angel taught Adam that the purpose of the sacrifice of the only begotten was to bring about an atonement wherein fallen man could be forgiven of his sins and be reconciled to God. Joseph Smith said that the law of sacrifice was instituted as a type through which man was to discern the importance and the necessity of this great sacrifice. Through it, God was able to teach the people of the coming of Christ and detail the Savior's atoning sacrifice. 
This was done through the use of types and symbols which the Lord wove into every aspect of the law. A type is something that represents spiritual truth through symbolic means. A similitude is something similar to something else. Thus, the animal offered as a sacrifice was a type of Christ. It represented Christ symbolically, and the offering of the animal was in similitude or similar to the future sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So I know as you were reading about the sacrifices, you probably thought some of them seemed really bizarre. And uh, our goal, my goal is to get beyond the seeming bizarre and to get to the meaning of the sacrifices. And just by that video right there, you can see that the sacrifices, though, they seem so weird and odd and strange to our culture, to our day, to our present um, perception of the world. But in that day, they all understood sacrifice. They all gave animals. They, they, they slaughtered their animals. They ate their animals. And the Savior was, Jehovah was teaching them about what his mission would be in years to come um, by what they would do with these sacrifices in the book of Leviticus. So again, we want to get beyond the bizarre. We want to help it meaningful. Well, there were five major offerings. There was the peace offering, trespass, the meal, the sin, and the burnt offering. And in all the animal sacrifices, there were six important acts. The presentation of the sacrifice, the laying out of hands, slaughtering the animal, pouring it out, uh, pouring out of the sprinkling of the blood, I should say, burning the sacrifice on the altar, and then the sacrificial meal. So sometimes, uh, in the case at least of the peace offerings, the priest would get to eat some of the meal. Um, the people that offer the animal would get to eat some of the meal, not in the burnt offering, uh, but and we'll talk more about that. In fact, let's jump in. Let's talk about the burnt offering, which starts out in chapter 1. In ver chapter 1, verse 3, it says, If this offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. So again, here's the question I throw out to you. How does the burnt offering typify the atonement of Jesus Christ? Because that's what we're trying to do, right? Well, first of all, let's look at verse 3. It was without blemish, and the offerer had to do it voluntarily, right? Yet the offerer had to give it. A, he couldn't be forced. And by the way, it, it was usually a young sheep or goat, at least for the average individual. If you were wealthy, you could offer a bull, and doves and pigeons were for the poor. Uh, so, and of course, they had to be without defect. So really, the Lord's giving everybody an opportunity to sacrifice depending on, on how much they have. And Christ, so as you know, Christ, uh, with, uh, it was a male without blemish. That's pointing us to the Savior because he was male, and, but also he was without blemish. He was the perfect sacrifice. And as you know, he gave his life um, voluntarily. He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Um, and then if we look at verse 4, he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. So the offerer would lay his hands upon it, and you would transmit your identity to the animal, and it became a substitute to pay the penalty for your sins, just like Jesus became a penalty to pay for my sins. Um Thus, I, I, I want to say the most innocent would suffer the most so I could go free, go free. This brings us to the next verse. He shall kill the bullock before the Lord. Uh, sprinkle the blood, shall bring the blood, sprinkle the blood round about the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle. Interesting, King Benjamin said that of Jesus Christ, uh, blood cometh from every pore, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness of his people. Luke 22 also teaches that he bled from every pore. And blood symbolized both life and the giving of one's life. Uh, death is a consequence of sin, and so the animal was slain to show what happens when man sins. Also, the animal is a type of Christ. And through the giving of his life for me, for you, 
uh, he gave it by the shedding of his blood. And the word, the Hebrew word, which is translated by the English word atonement, means to cover. We'll talk more about that again later. Thus, the smearing, splashing, or daubing of blood covered sins and thus brought about atonement. There's a, a beautiful paradox in the idea that the righteous are those whose garments are white through the blood of the lamb. Which brings us to another point in verse 6. He, the priest would flay the burnt offering and then he would cut it in pieces. Now, I don't know how the flaying of animal, uh, the animal points to Christ, but the, the hide was given to the priest and Jesus serves everybody. So I don't know. Um, the, the worshiper generally was responsible for skinning the animal and cutting it into the pieces that would be placed on the altar, unless the priest was sacrificing for the, all of Israel. And, and then this is uh, one of my favorite parts of pointing this, you know, this sacrifice to Christ, is that you had to burn all on the altar. Every bit of it. All of it was given, except for the hide. So how does the burnt offering typify the atonement of Jesus Christ? Well, I want to say Jesus gave all. You know, his final words from the cross, if we go to John chapter 19, in verse 28, he says, <clears throat> I thirst. And then, so there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and they put it on hyssop, and they put it to his mouth. And when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Um, to me, that phrase is so powerful, it is finished. And he says it in the same breath of tasting that, that bitter, acidic vinegar. To me, this vinegar was the last bitter cup Jesus would have to take. It represented the final step of the atonement. He had literally given all, sacrificed all, suffered to the nth term, to the very end. And when he tasted that bitter drink, he's like, it's done. I, I did it. Spirit probably testified to him, you have finished, you have accomplished, you have conquered. You can now go back to your father. And he says, it's finished, Bo. Well, <clears throat> the, in verse 11, it says that um, you should take the animal, kill it on the side of the altar on, northward before the Lord and the priest Aaron and son shall sprinkle the blood around about. Why northward? Uh, what, what's, what's that teaching us about Christ? Well, here, here's a, I'm going to throw out a hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> uh, the temple, so this right here is the area of Golgotha and Calgary. You can see in the middle there, where Jesus was placed on the cross. And then if you look to the left there, that is the tomb. Today it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And, and this whole area right here is on the north side of the city of Jerusalem. And so if you look at the very top of the screen, the temple was a couple hundred yards south of here. So Jesus was literally placed on the north side of the city. That's where his body, that's where he died. That's where his body was laid. That's where he was resurrected. That's where he conquered death. So yeah, interesting, huh? Uh, so let's talk about the meal offering or the grain offering. The I learned question I threw out to you before class started was, what does the flour, oil, frankincense, and salt typify in the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do they point us to Christ? Well, the bringing together of the oil and the frankincense and the grain and the salt that really is instructive. Um, frankincense, as you can see there on the left, uh, symbolized prayer. Uh, if you look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, you see it making a reference to the altar of incense and the prayers uh, of man rising up to heaven. As man was meant to live physically by eating bread, so too he was meant to live spiritually by partaking of the word of the Spirit of the Lord through prayer. Now that second uh, middle part there, it also oil was used in the scriptures to symbolize the Holy Ghost. You look at uh, DNC 45, verse 56. It says, uh, they, the wise virgins, are the parable of the ten virgins, 
They are wise and have received the truth, have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have been deceived. Remember, they had oil in their cup and they had oil in their lamps and they had take the Holy, they had, what did they have with them? They had the Holy Spirit with them. They had the oil, the word of the, the, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord. And then grain symbolized the word of God. Um, in Mark chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus compares the word to a seed. And so, so symbolic there, very, very symbolic of, of you know, all of these things uh, that are to help us come unto Christ. And then uh, right here it says, and the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron and his sons. Those portions of the sacrifice were burned uh, uh, were designated as holy, whereas the portions to be eaten were designated as most holy. Now, I think that is most interesting. I'll tell you why in a minute. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar. Memorial, the Hebrew word is uh, azkarah, and it's derived from the Hebrew word zakar, and it just means to remember. When we, just as the priest ate, the part he ate was the most holy part, Likewise, on Sunday, when we partake of the bread and eat in remembrance or uh, azkara, right? Uh, as we eat in remembrance, oops, gone too far. We uh, also are doing the same thing. We are making a memorial, remembering what Jesus has done to us. And just as they remember Jehovah as they ate the unleavened bread, so we're to remember him when we eat the broken bread. Well, peace offering, Leviticus chapter 3. I, I, I made a picture here. I didn't make it, but I found this picture. It, looks, it makes the food look yummy, right? Because peace offering was a part where the people could eat of the food. The name of the sacrifice uh, in Hebrew is, is Shelamin. And Shelamin, anytime you see mim, I say Shelamin, Shelamin. When you see mim on the end of the word, like Elohim, it just pluralizes, like Elohim is God. Uh, Elohim is God's. And the name of the sacrifice is Shalomim, and it's a plural form of Shalom, which means peace. And the peace offering could be either male or female, but the burnt offering had to be a male animal. The peace offerings had a lower level of holiness and could be eaten by the one making the offering, not just the priest. By contrast, only the priest could eat of the grain offering or sin offering. So um, the fat and the blood, in a peace offering, the fat and the blood were, were offered to Yahweh, and the rest of the meat, could, that's the part that could be eaten. Uh, but it had to be eaten within one or two days. I don't know how that points to Jesus, but it's interesting. No, it's sort of interesting. I don't want to say everything's interesting because not everything is, but I don't know what it means. Okay. These sacrifices could be offered in thanksgiving for fulfillment of a vow or a free will offering. And here's, uh, I was just going to say, this is interesting. I actually think this part's interesting. The priest must present the fat of this peace offering as a special gift to the Lord. So the fat back then, everybody wanted to eat the fat, the fat. Uh, the best steaks have marbling fat all through them, like a ribeye or, you know. And this, and this, by the way, this is the New Translation Bible so I, I like this to read it because it's easier to understand. This includes the fat of the broad tail cut off near the backbone, kidneys, long lobe of the liver. So the, the priest was to burn them all. So I wanted to show you that. So back then, so southwestern Mediterranean Arabia, their sheep, they're known for ex exceptionally broad fatty tails. And the broad tail, could that tail could weigh up to 15 pounds. But, and the people like to eat it you know, or put it in their, their, mix the fat in their food and give it flavor. But the Lord's like, nope, that's mine. You got to give it to me. Well, let's talk about sin offerings. In verse two, the Lord says, if a soul shall sin through ignorance, now that's important, through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, um, the he shall offer, it goes on to say, he shall offer a, a Khatat or sin offering. Khatat um, means it's a root meaning to miss or not hit the mark, kind of like in a bullseye, to stumble, but also to stumble or fall. In other words, a, a, a khatat offering, a sin offering, uh, this offering covered those sins which 
maybe they were committed inadvertently. Um, uh, they, maybe they came from the weakness of the flesh. You know, maybe some people are just born with a temper. They didn't ask for it. Maybe there's struggle with, uh, uh, born with um, uh, addiction, uh, whether it's a sexual addiction or a drug addiction or, and, uh, and, 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 or other just same sex trend, you know, whatever it is, they're struggling with it and they're fighting it to conquer it and overcome it. And, and so because of those kind of sins, the Lord understands that sacrifice illustrates the fact that sin, even when not deliberately committed though, even though we may not, you know, intentionally sin, the natural man in us, we still make mistakes. We lose our temper. We, we have a, you know, a bad thought. And so, but we're still under justice, right? Or we've still sinned. So I like what Mosiah, King Mosiah, King Benjamin said in Mosiah 3. He said, Behold, also Christ's blood atoneth for the sins of those who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them, who have ignorantly sinned. My students have asked me over the years, I've taught uh, 28 years, I think now, and I, I get this question all the time. What about all those sins that I forget to repent about? How does Jesus, how does Jesus pay for those? Does Jesus pay for those sins? Um, I didn't repent of them. I forgot to ask him when I knelt in prayer that night. And I'm like, uh, katat. <laughs> That's a katat offering, you know? That's why Jesus died for us, to compensate for the things we forget about, for the things we don't mean to do, right? So uh, we go on. Let's go on and talk more about it. And the priest uh, that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood, and then verse 6, And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. Verse 7, And he shall, the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense. By the reason there were horns on the altar is horns were a symbol of power. I, I, as you can see there on the left on that altar uh, sacri of sacrifice. Those horns, to me, teaching this symbolic, symbolically teaching that the power of, of the atonement of Jesus Christ to remove uh, the penalty for my sins, to pay for the penalty for my sins. So I don't have to suffer as he did. Um, and, and pour all the blood, Lord says, after you dip your fingers on the horns of the altar. Uh, it was the altar of incense. I want to say also the altar of sacrifice. But he says, and pour the blood at the bottom of the altar, the burnt, uh, the, the altar of sacrifice there. So um, why does he do this? What's, what's this all about? Well, let's watch another video. Of all the elements of the ordinance of sacrifice, nothing played a more prominent part than the administration of the blood of the offering. The manner of its offering was minutely specified by the Lord. Depending on the offering, the blood was dabbed upon the horns, sprinkled or splashed upon all four sides of the altar, or dumped out at the base of the altar. The Lord chose the blood to dramatize the consequences of sin and what was involved in the process of forgiveness and reconciliation. Therefore, the blood symbolized both life and the shedding of blood or the giving of one's life. Death is the consequence of sin, and so the animal was slain to show what happens when man sins. Also, the animal was a type of Christ. Through the giving of his life for us, the shedding of his blood, we who are spiritually dead because of sin can find new life. Out of this grows a spiritual parallel. As in Adam, or by nature, all men fall and are subject to spiritual death, so in Christ and his atoning sacrifice, all men have power to gain eternal life. The purpose of the shedding of blood was to bring expiation or atonement. The Hebrew verb, which is translated by the English word atonement, means to cover. The connotation is not that the sin is no longer existent, nor that the offerer, through some performance or act, had paid or made compensation for sin. Rather, it suggested that the sin had been covered over, or, as the scriptures state, blotted out before God through his grace or loving kindness. That is to say, its power of separating man from God had been taken away. Thus the blood becomes a symbol for the whole process by which man becomes reconciled to God. From all of this it is apparent that those in Israel who were spiritually enlightened 
knew and understood that their sacrificial ordinances were in similitude of the coming death of him whose name they used to worship the Father, and that it was not the blood on their altars that brought remission of sins. All right. Of all the elements of... So, uh, let's talk just a little bit more uh, about how that we can point this. This points us to uh, Christ. What is the significance of burning the sin offering outside the camp? And again, they would take the bullock... Uh, you'd carry it forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and, and burn him on the wood with fire. And again, I, I just want to, I, I, I can't help but think that this was pointing us to Jesus going outside of the Temple Mount, going northward, going to Golgotha, going to the tomb uh, where his body would be laid. And the completion of the sacrifice uh, uh, Paul would say, you know, taking place, he, he, he saw in Christ's sacrifice the fulfillment, the typology uh, of the sin offering being burned outside the camp. In fact, he says, uh, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. And by the way, they're still sacrificing animals in Paul's day, right? So he's very familiar with this especially being a uh, educated Jew as he is. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, um, went out of the gate of the city. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. That last phrase is a little fuzzy. Uh, if you look up in, in a Bible, other Bible translations, I like one I found. I, I like what it says. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. So just as he suffered the most disgraceful death a Roman could conflict on any human being, um, Jesus, because he suffered that disgraceful death to save us, sometimes as we serve Christ, we have to suffer in disgrace too. Let me give you an example that Elder Holland shares. I say to all, and especially the youth of the church, that if you haven't already, you will one day find yourself called upon to defend your faith, or perhaps even endure some personal abuse, simply because you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Such moments will require both courage and courtesy on your part. For example, a sister missionary recently wrote to me, My companion and I saw a man sitting on a bench in the town square eating his lunch. As we drew near, he looked up and saw our missionary name tags. With a terrible look in his eye, he jumped up and raised his hand to hit me. I ducked just in time only to have him spit his food all over me and start swearing the most horrible things at us. We walked away, saying nothing. I tried to wipe the food off my face, only to feel a clump of mashed potato hit me in the back of the head. Sometimes, she wrote, it's hard being a missionary. Because right then, I wanted to go back, grab that little man, and say, excuse me, <laughs> but I didn't. To this devoted missionary, I say, dear child, you have in your own humble way stepped into a circle of very distinguished women and men who have, as the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob said, viewed Christ's death and suffered his cross and borne the shame of the world. All right. All right, let's talk about the last uh, offering, the trespass offering. And uh, uh, in the trespass offering, uh, people, th this is one where, uh, I like the Bible dictionary says, it says, uh, trespass or guilt offerings were a particular kind of sin offering. All sins were transgressions of the laws of the covenant, but certain sins might be regarded as a robbery or a violation of a right or an injury 
whether in relation to God or, or regarded as the king of Israel. You know, so just you trespass against somebody or something, which I think brings us to a, a question. So, so what's the difference between a sin offering and a trespass offering? Well, I like what the, I love, love what the student manual teaches. We naturally look at what man does rather than what he is. Uh, but God judges us what we are as well as what we do, right? Our sin, the sin in us, as much as our trespasses. And in his sight, sin is in us. Our evil nature is as clearly seen as our trespasses, which are but the fruit of that nature. So there's a sin that's in us, a natural man that's in us, and that's sin, but there's also that sin, that natural man in us that, that sometimes tempts us to trespass against others. That's the fruit of the sin that's in us, right? Now the distinction, the student manual goes on to say, the distinction between the sin and the trespass offering is just this. One is for the sin in our nature, the natural man. The other for the fruits of it, like when we trespass against others. In the sin offering, no particular act of sin is mentioned, but a certain person is standing confessedly as a sinner. Uh, and in the trespass offering, certain acts are enumerated, like robbery and so forth. So, all right, so enough about sacrifices. Let's go to Leviticus 11. And now Levit Leviticus 11 talks about the dietary laws. And if we go back to New Testament in Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision where the Lord lowers a sheep full of unclean animals and, and the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. This would be like the Lord appearing to you or at least having a vision. The Lord saying, arise, go to 7-Eleven and buy a Coors beer and drink it. And you'd say, no, never, Lord. Uh, never at any time have I ever drinking anything or smoked anything or did anything you've asked me not to do to violate the word of wisdom. Well, the Lord says to him, what God hath cleansed, call not thou common or vulgar. Um, it was the Lord's way of teaching Peter that it's time to take the gospel to the Gentiles of whom Jews thought were unclean, right? So where does this idea, why, where did Peter le learn this? He learned it from Leviticus 11. And according to Leviticus 11, um, uh, it names all the animals that are clean and unclean. So I'm just curious, uh, let's test your knowledge. Which one of these are clean and unclean? Can you see one that you're like, okay, that one's for sure is clean. And that one unclean? Is there one you're not sure about? Well, I want to show you a quick video that I think will help clarify. Uh, and, it, and it's teaching what Jews, and Jews still go by these dietary laws today. Brought to you by GetKosher.com. Kosher? What is it? What does it mean? What makes it kosher? Kosher in Hebrew means fit, correct, or proper. Kosher is the set of Jewish dietary laws that dictate what kinds of foods can be eaten, how they need to be prepared, and what foods can be eaten together. Kosher goes back thousands of years, and it was written in the Torah. The first part of kosher is the types of animals that can be eaten, and also what parts of the animal can be eaten. It is written in the Torah, any animal that chews the cud and has a cloven hoof is kosher. Cows, sheep, goats, and deer are kosher. Pigs are not kosher. It is forbidden to eat birds of prey and scavenger birds such as bats and vultures. Chicken, duck, geese, turkey are all kosher. Insects and crawling things like worms are not kosher. Fish need to have both fins and scales to be kosher. Scavenger fish are not kosher. Next part is the preparation of the food. It needs to follow strict rules in order to be kosher. Animals must be slaughtered so that there is as little pain as possible. Also, only healthy animals are kosher. Animals are carefully inspected, and if they don't meet strict requirements, they are not kosher. Any processed foods need to be prepared under strict rabbinical supervision. Foods are checked carefully to make sure the right ingredients are used and that it does not contain any small insects. It must be perfect in order to be kosher. 
The third part of kosher is not mixing meat and milk together. Cheeseburgers are not kosher. All meat and dairy utensils must be kept separate, so there is no accidental mixing of the two. There's a lot more to kosher and understanding it, and we recommend visiting Wikipedia and Kab. When I was in Israel many years ago, uh, we were dying for a cheeseburger, and we could not find anywhere that would sell a hamburger. And, <coughs> excuse me, the last day of our tour there, one of the girls, one of the sisters that was just so frustrated, she made her husband take her downtown. It's, it was really far away that we heard of one place, a hamburger place. I think it was McDonald's. But he, she she goes there. She's like, I am done. I, I, I am so ready for a hamburger. And, uh, yeah, kind of a interesting little funny story uh when we when we flew into LaGuardia airport in New York after you know being in Egypt and Israel for a couple of weeks we were so hungry for American food we all ran to a pizza place <laughs> and so yeah that has nothing to do with today's lesson but all right so let's go on so let me test you here okay so let's see which one is the camel is he clean or unclean well he chews the cud but he doesn't divide the hoof. It looks like he does, but he really doesn't. If you look close at a camel's foot, uh, which I have, <laughs> and they are not, uh, they are not cloven. So he is unclean. Uh, goats, uh, cows, sheep, uh, they all chew the cud and they divide the hoof. So they're okay, right? Uh, pig, Porky the pig. Now you all know he doesn't, he's not clean. And he divides the hoof, but doesn't chew the cud. And by the way, um, uh, Muslims don't eat pig as well. And many years ago when I was at BYU, Provo, I was teaching, I was in a physics class. And my study partner, Wakar Ahmad, one of my favorite people in the whole world, I invited him over for dinner. And I was so excited to fix Wakar a meal. And Wakar, um, I, I, I worked so hard on it, and, and I just put the plate on the table in front of him and he about died when he saw that I had barbecued pork ribs. <laughs> and so luckily there were other things there that he could eat. But yeah, Muslims and Jews don't eat pig. Uh, what about these little creatures right here? How about Sebastian on the left? Can you eat him? Nope. Uh, nope, you can't eat him. You can't eat Flipper either on the right there because um, um, it has to have skin, it has a uh, skin, <laughs> it has to have fins and scales. So, so catfish, tuna, squid, surgeon, they, they don't count. Uh, lobster, no shrimp, dang. So um, yeah, how about um, the mouse there, Mickey the mouse? Now he's unclean. He's, um, so yeah, any kind of vermin are considered uh, unclean. Uh, rabbits, um, are, they, are they clean or unclean? Well, they should be clean since they don't have a hoof. But, but if you ever, I used to raise rabbits and, and they, they move their mouth really fast, just and they look like they're chewing the cud. So they have thought they chew the cud, but they didn't know they really, but actually they, you know, they don't chew the cud. Sort of like they chew the cud, but they don't have a split cloven hoof. So therefore they're unclean. But yeah, so the Lord is probably just going with uh, what they understood in their minds as he often does. And then of course, um, yeah, you can't, can't eat predators of any kind, right? Can't eat. You can have poultry, doves, chicken, ducks, geese, uh, carrion birds, um, predator birds that hunt dead animals or carnivores. You can't eat. You can't eat those, right? Yeah, turkeys. You can. Uh, owls. Nope. Yeah. Um, can you eat him? Yeah, actually, you can. Um, John the Baptist would. Um, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. He says that right at the end of Leviticus 11, after giving the dietary laws, it's interesting, he's teaching, I am holy. These things will make you holy. And, uh, and I, I want to bear testimony to you that as Paul taught, our, our bodies are temples. And as we take care of our temples, as we are careful, we have our own dietary laws in our church, just like the Jews do, just like the Muslims do. And as we live those dietary laws, as we avoid alcohol and tobacco and, and, and coffee and tea and, and drugs, and as we, as we keep ourselves healthy and, and live a healthy life, 
I bear witness to us. We will, you, I bear witness to you. We will have the Spirit with us. Um, we will be holy as Jesus is holy. Well, Leviticus chapter 16 talks about the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, unlike the Sabbath or the Passover, the Passover took place, if you look at this um, Holy Land calendar, you, you look at March, April, or, or Hebrew lunar calendar, Nisan, that's when the Passover, the unleavened bread, and then 49 days later, 50 days later, Pentecost. But in the fall came the Day of Atonement. And that's when all manual labor stopped. I mean, there was no feasting, no frolicking. It was, this is a more, probably the, the least fun, but it was, it was one of the high, uh, um, the high celebrations. It was instead a time to afflict one's soul by fasting, a day to cleanse oneself from sin, a day of prayer, a meditation, and deep introspection. And the high priest, he had to go through meticulous preparation to be worthy to act as an officiator for the rest of the house of Israel because he would go in the Holy of Holies and he would atone for uh, all the Israelites. He would um, daub blood on the, um, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And so he had to purify himself, his house, by washing and purifying. He also had to wash and purify various objects in the tab tabernacle of the temple, that place had to be sacred for the Lord to come and to accept this offering and this sacrifice. And the high priest would also put off um, official robes that he, he normally wore, and he just clothed himself in simple white linen garment. I don't know what that's symbolic, how that points to Jesus, but maybe because they stripped him of his robes, I don't know. And then there were two goats that were chosen by Lot, uh, one was designated as the goat of the Lord, as you see on the left, and the name of Jehovah was placed upon that goat. And then one was designated as the scapegoat, uh, the goat uh, Azazel, the one on the right, and the goat of Jehovah, the one on the left, was offered as a sin offering, and the high priest took its blood into the Holy of Holies and the tabernacle and sprinkled it on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, and it's called the mercy seat, thus making the atonement for the sins of Israel." Now, um, as you see there, it says in verse 15, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, meaning the goat of the Lord or the goat that Jehovah's name was put on, that is for the people to bring his blood within the veil and do that with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Now, the other goat, the goat Azel, was brought before the high priest who laid his hands upon its head and symbolically transferred all of the sin Israel, uh, all of the sins of Israel to it. So as you can see in the verse there at the top, and can, he would confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. So he's laid his hands on them and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting the, upon them uh, the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Now the word here, um, az, um, Azazel, uh, the word is usually translated as scapegoat, but sometimes it's treated, some treat it as a proper name, Azazel, capital A. And since Yahweh is a proper name and the goats are described in the same way, Hebrew parallelism, uh, parallelism suggests that Azazel is also a proper name and not just meaning, uh, you know, scapegoat. <clears throat> if that's true, then that might explain why later uh, Jewish texts, um, such as First Enoch, they will name uh, the name of a demon associated with the desert is called Azazel. And so they would send the goat. <clears throat> uh, they were sending the goat that carried the sins, uh, their sin outside the land deemed holy for Yahweh into a territory understood to be under Azazel's jurisdiction. Even Paul himself said, "The devil is the prince of this world." So, so th this this world uh, is where that goat would go and bear the sins of the world. And you know, it's interesting. Jesus Christ, Jehovah, God of the Old Testament, will be born to Mary in Bethlehem and will grow up 
into a land, into a world of sin, into this celestial world, and he will allow Azazel, Satan, to destroy him and to hurt him. He will come into our world, uh, leave a holy place, and come into the wilderness to suffer. And in fact, the, I like this Faith Life Study Bible quote, the goat was driven into the wilderness to Azazel where sin belonged. The goat was the means to richly transport sin to the demonic realm since sin could not be tolerated on holy ground. Rabbinic literature records stories of how Jews in the first century at AD were so frightened the goat for Azazel would return that they would, they would drive it over a cliff. They saw it when they were out there playing, throwing rocks, hunting, they'd, they'd make it jump over the cliff if they could. Well, Jews still, do they? So um, this sacred day, the Day of Atonement, it's called Yom Kippur. Yom means day, Kippur means to cover. And yes, they still uh, participate in this today. And I want to show you uh, just a quick 60-second clip that explains it. Shalom and welcome to Parsha on 60 Seconds. Today's portion is bonus round, round, round. Yom Kippur. It's a bonus round. Yom Kippur, also known as the Day of Atonement, is the holiest day of the year for the Jewish people worldwide. Atonement and repentance are of utmost importance. Yom Kippur completes the annual period known in Judaism as the High Holy Days, or Yamim Noraim, which means Days of Awe. In ancient times, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies to put the blood of the sacrificed animals on the altar as a sin offering. Through faith, obedience to God's precise instructions resulted in atonement, or covering, for sin for one year. Today, Yom Kippur is a day of fasting and reflection upon one's sin. According to Jewish tradition, God inscribes each person's fate for the coming year into the Book of Life on Rosh Hashanah, and during Yom Kippur, God's verdict is made and the book is sealed. Yom Kippur draws all sorts of Jewish people back to the synagogue, including Orthodox Jews, Conservative Jews, Reformed Jews, Confused Jews, Secular Jews, Jews for Jesus, Atheist Jews, and Wannabe Jews, causing synagogue attendance to soar. And that is Yom Kippur in 60 seconds. Now again, Yom meaning day, Kippur meaning to cover. The, it's interesting that the Hebrew noun for the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is kaporeth, and it literally translates to covering, because a lid covers the box, right? And it's from the verb kafar, so kaporeth comes from kafar, and it means to atone or to cover. And by the way, the Ark of the Covenant, that lid, that mercy seat on top, uh, that kafar or that kaporeth, uh, is where Jesus could come into the house of the Lord. It was symbolic of his throne, where he could come and sit. S and, and, and I want to say that Yom Kippur, um, Day of Atonement, it's the one day of the year when the high priest he enters the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, uh, Kodesh Kodeshim is what it's called in Hebrew, where the ark is located. He sprinkles it with blood for the sins of the people. And the translation mercy seat um, uh, is based on how the Septuagint and the Vulgate, the Greek and the Latin versions of the Old Testament, um, how they handled their Hebrew word kaporeth. So instead of the literal translation covering, these ancient translations interpret the noun term to mean mercy and the slab as the seat. And so, um, yeah, just so, so Kaporath uh, was in effect the throne of Yahweh on the earth. And so you see all the connections here that are really interesting. So, yeah, so what do these rituals involving these goats teach us about the atonement of Jesus Christ? Well, Exodus 16 says, and this shall be an everlasting statute to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year, and he did as the Lord commanded Moses. You know, the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 9, verse 28 says, Christ once suffered or once offered to bear sins of man. Uh, in Hebrews 10, verse 12 and 14, Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever. This once a year, Yom Kippur, the covering of our sins, blotting of our sins, that was performed in the Kodesh Kodeshim, uh, in the Holy of Holies, uh, that is, to me, the quintessential moment that teaches points to that day. Uh, Thursday night when Jesus would go in the Garden of Gethsemane, Friday when he would go on the cross in Golgotha. That was the ultimate sacrifice. He did it once for us, 
and once was all it took. Once was all it, all we needed. And uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll uh, I want to show you this this clip here that depicts that that once in the universe, this great event, the greatest event in the entire universe, in all time and in all places, the atonement of Jesus Christ. I bear witness to you that Jesus Christ gave everything for us. And our Heavenly Father gave everything for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. May I close with this. Personal sacrifice never was placing an animal on the altar, said Elder Maxwell. Instead, it is a willingness to put the animal in us upon the altar and letting it be consumed for the denial of self precedes the full acceptance of him. I bear witness to you that he gave everything. I bear witness that Jesus is the Christ. He gave all that he had. And he doesn't require me to give everything that I have, but he does ask me to be willing to do so, right? I bear witness to you that he lives and he loves us. And I know that with all of my heart, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.